Chapter 21, 10 to 1. Within three days after the emperor left Paris, news of victory arrived. On January 27th, he dislodged Blucher from St. Desire, and the next day, but one, he defeated him at Breen. More successes followed. Napoleon routed Blucher again at Champaubert. He crushed Stockin and York at Montmirail and Chateau Thierry. Schwarzenberg, in his turn, was cut to pieces at Mormons. Nongus and Montereau and driven back on Troyes. Napoleon had given himself a breathing spell. He could take heart again. Schwarzenberg asked for an armistice. The wretches fall on their knees at the first defeat, cried the emperor. He felt himself the stronger. Now the roles were reversed. It was he who would soon be able to dictate his terms to his enemies. He even felt in a position to make a final effort to detach Austria from the hostile coalition. On Feb- February 17th, he received from Marie-Louise a bonbon box on which Mademoiselle Thibault had painted a portrait of the King of Rome. The boy was represented on his knees, saying his prayers, I want you to get this portrait engraved, Napoleon wrote to his wife, with this device, I pray God to save my father and France. The engraving was given away in all directions. Napoleon himself sent several copies of it to his father-in-law in the hope of softening him, but the son-in-law was cherishing an illusion if he counted on Papa Francis's family feeling. In fact, on March 1st, at Chaumont, England, Prussia and Russia signed a treaty binding themselves not to lay down their arms until France was reduced to her former frontiers. Now that he knew where he stood, Napoleon conceived a daring plan. Augurau's army, which was at Lyons, would ascend the Seine and establish itself in the Vosges. Napoleon himself would fall upon the enemy's rear and join hands with Augurau, with the help of the garrisons in the east, which would sally from their besieged fortresses. They would then cut the Allies' communications and crush them in the plains of Champagne. Everywhere Napoleon went, the people plucked up courage. As soon as he appeared, his presence galvanized their hearts. The peasants, enraged at the outrages committed by the Cossacks, hastened to dig up the weapons they had buried. For a moment, the Allies faltered. Napoleon inspired them with something like terror. What could they do against this devil of a man who was everywhere at once and routed the strongest armies in the world? with a handful of conscripts. But the emperor had no time to lose. He pursued Blucher, who had pulled his army together again. The Prussian army beat a retreat northwards in order to effect a junction with Bernadotte's Swedes and Wintzingerod's Russians, who were coming up in support of it. Napoleon reckoned that he would be able to annihilate the Prussians 
under the walls of Soissons if the garrison held out, but meanwhile Soissons surrendered. No matter. Napoleon continued his pursuit of Blucher. He captured Reims, crossed the Asn, and on March 7th at Crayon gained a victory over the Russians and the Prussians. But then he learned that Schwarzenberg, who had received reinforcements, was again advancing on Paris and had reached Nogent. Napoleon must hasten to protect Paris. In addition, he had an opportunity, too good to miss, of falling on the rear of the Austrians and wrecking havoc upon them. So he swung round like a wild beast and made a dash for them. He passed through Reims again, then Epernay, and so across Champagne. At the news of Napoleon's threat to their rear, the Austrians fell back hastily on Troyes. On March 20th, at aris sur abou the little French army and the formidable Austrian army found themselves face to face, 25,000 men against 100,000. Napoleon knew that here he was going to play a decisive game. Battle was joined. Followed by his escort, Napoleon spurred into the forefront. For a few moments he was caught in a flurry with Cossacks and Hossers sabering at one another. He got out of it by the skin of his teeth. Ceaselessly, the enemy's squadrons returned to the charge. Is there no end to them, murmured Napoleon. Since he could not conquer, let him die. His death would at least be an advantage to the little king. The moment had come for him to sacrifice himself, and so make sure of the throne for his son. A shell fell close to him. Napoleon spurred his horse toward it. His regiments shouted in alarm. Exelmans was on the point of darting after his master, but Sebastiani held him back. Leave him alone, he said. Can't you see? He's doing it on purpose. He wants to make an end. The shell burst. The smoke cleared. And Napoleon appeared alive, on his feet, with his horse wounded beside him. Well, he had done his best. Death would have none of him. But the French army was falling back under weight of superior numbers. They are too many for us, murmured Napoleon. Depression seized upon him. This war was like the rock of Sisyphus, and he alone had to bear the burden of it. Agrao had gone to sleep at Lyons. Marat was betraying him. His wearied generals were making mistakes, and he could not repair all of them. I am no longer obeyed, he said to himself. I need to be everywhere at once. Only his stepson, Eugene, remained faithful to him. In Italy, Eugene was holding the Austrians on the Taro and the Neapolitans on the Mincio. But Napoleon had made up his mind to fight to his last breath. He gathered his little army together and fell back towards Vitry-le-Francois, hoping to draw the enemy after him and keep them away from Paris. But his general staff had lost confidence. Where are we going? What is to become of us? His generals asked one another anxiously. Blucher and Schwarzenberg 
had effected a junction between Shalons and Arcus. Never since the days of the Huns had the vast plain of Champagne seen so many soldiers, but the Allies hesitated. Should they advance straight against Napoleon, or should they march upon the capital? Talleyrand, who was working on their side, helped them out of their dilemma. Let them come to Paris. They would be warmly welcomed. So on March 23rd, the mass of the enemy swept like a great flood into the basin of the Ile-de-France. Napoleon heard the news of the Allies' decision at saint Désir. At the same time, he learned that Marmont and Mortier, who were covering Paris with absurdly small forces, had been crushed at La Faire Champenois and Cezanne. The road to Paris lay open before the Allies. At first, the Emperor was inclined to congratulate himself. Let the enemy enter Paris. They would find their graves there. But around him, his entourage grew uneasy. He was besieged with questions. Surely he would not sacrifice Paris. Everybody trembled for his family, his property, his interest. Abruptly, the emperor changed his mind. So be it. He would hasten to save Paris. Would he be in time? Paris might hold out for a few days, but he must make haste. On March 28th, Napoleon left saint Désir. On the 29th, at Dolincourt Bridge, he heard that the road to Troyes was clear. At once he dispatched General de Gene to inform the people of Paris that he was on his way back. That night he reached Troyes. After a few hours' rest, he set off again. On the way he learnt that Mox was in the enemy's hands. At the next halt, he heard that the Empress and the King of Rome had left Paris. The enemy were now at the gates of the capital. There was not a moment to lose. On March 30th, at villeneuve sur Napoleon abandoned his escort and, with Colincourt, got into a fast gig. Drouot and Flahot followed in another gig. The horses ate up the road. Withdrawn into himself, Napoleon brooded over plans of defense and attack. The Allies by no means held victory in their hands yet. It was ten o'clock at night, at an inn called the Court of France, five leagues from Paris, the vehicles stopped to change horses. A group, <clears throat> a group of horsemen emerged out of the darkness, riding hard. Halt! shouted the emperor. The leader of the detachment came forward. He was General Bellard. Napoleon greeted him. What are you doing here? Where are the enemy? Where is the army? Who is defending Paris? Ballard's reply dumbfounded him. Paris was about to surrender. Surrender stormed Napoleon, half speechless with dismay and rage. But what has happened to my soldiers? What has happened to my cannon? What is Joseph doing? What is Clark doing? And where are the Empress and the King of Rome? At length, Ballard managed to make himself heard. In broken sentences, he gave details of the disaster. Marmont and Mortier 
had been able to rally from the from their rout only a handful of soldiers the people of paris had become demoralized they believed that the emperor was abandoning them to their fate the empress's departure had deepened their depression when the enemy came in sight the wealthy and middle classes had thought only about surrender but the lower classes had rebelled the workmen had demanded arms and joined the national guard a few thousand men had advanced to meet the enemy the village of pontin was lost and won back but the enemy's pincers closed in they occupied per la chaise menomontant and the boots chamont one after the other then joseph gave marmont authority to surrender at five o'clock hostilities were suspended and the general staffs on either side met to arrange the handing over of the city it was at this moment that billard left paris napoleon listened to his story with somber eyes bathed in a cold sweat his legs gave way under him and he sat down at the roadside with his head in his hands all at once he stood up again he hurried his suite into the inn he unfolded a map and run his keen eyes over it then after a long silence he exclaimed yes i've got them god has delivered them into my hands he turned to calling court and took him by the lapel of his coat four days i want four days time for my army to arrive and victory is mine you will set off at once and get into touch with the emperor alexander parley with him string the negotiations out but get me those four days confidence had come back to him his suite stared at one another in a daze where could he find strength to go on hoping had he gone mad napoleon dragged his suite outside again walking up and down the road he went on questioning ballard and what about montmartre how did it come about that montmartre was taken without a shot being fired montmartre sire was lacking in artillery and ammunition and what about my brother where was my brother did you see him on the battlefield ballard waved his hand in a way that implied that the army had seen nothing of king joseph on that disastrous day napoleon flew into a rage in short everybody seems to have lost his head that's what comes of employing men with no common sense no energy and that fool joseph imagined he was as fit to command an army as i am and that idiot clark he's no good for anything outside office routine he turned to colin court and the officers who accompanied him you have heard what ballard has said <clears throat> gentlemen well i must go to paris if i'm not on the spot <clears throat> people simply behave like fools calling court order my carriage but sire objected ballard by this time the surrender may be signed 
Paris may be evacuated. Napoleon refused to listen to him. I'm going back to Paris. I'll order the bells to be rung. Everybody will take up arms. Then Colincourt intervened. It would be madness, sire. You would be putting your head into the wolf's mouth. Colincourt pointed to the campfires of the hostile army, which lit up the hills along the right bank of the Seine, like a conflagration. Napoleon was shaken. He bowed his head. Very well, he said, I'll wait. Then he issued orders. Flahot would carry instructions to Marmont to break off negotiations and continue the defense of Paris. Colincourt would get into touch with the Allied sovereigns with full power to negotiate and conclude peace. Flot set off at full speed on a trooper's horse. The emperor went back to the inn, shut himself up in a bedroom, and bent over his maps. From time to time, he raised his head and stared at the campfires across the river. Their light seemed to burn his eyes. He recalled the time when he had camped outside Vienna, outside Berlin, outside Moscow. Now it was he who was suffering the affront of the enemy's presence. It was he who was beaten. His wounded pride hurt him like a festering sore. He banged his fist on the table. Four days. Let heaven grant me four days, and they shall see. At three o'clock in the morning, a messenger dispatched by Colin Court arrived. The news he brought fell upon Napoleon like a blow from a sledgehammer. The terms of surrender had been signed. During the night, the enemy would enter Paris in the morning. Napoleon sat down, with his arms hanging lax. In his dismay, he searched in his mind for something to which to cling. Paris, France. For the time being, they had ceased to exist. But there was his son. There was his wife, his dear Louise. He must comfort her. He took a pen and a sheet of paper and wrote, My dear, <clears throat> I come here to defend Paris, but it was too late. The city surrendered during the night. I am assembling my army in the neighborhood of Fontainebleau. I am in good health. I suffer for you in what you must be suffering. Nap. The Court of France, March 31st at three o'clock in the morning. Chapter 22 Falling Crown For weeks before this, a shadow had seemed to hang over the Tuileries. Despite Napoleon's orders, the truth seeped into the palace, and Marie-Louise began to get anxious. The King of Rome lived through the same events with the apparent indifference of childhood, but his young eyes did not fail to note that something in his surroundings was changed. Why did they put him into uniform every day? Why had he to attend reviews and be present at parades every afternoon? Why did people around him get into corners and cry one day and laugh for no reason the next? The boy became nervous. He slept badly. One night he tossed and cried in his sleep to such an extent that Madame Marchand, his nurse, had to wake him up and comfort him. The next day, his mother asked him 
what had been wrong with him. All he would say was this: "I dreamed about my dear papa." It was on the night of March twentieth, the night of that day, when at Arsis Sorab, Napoleon had vainly sought death on the battlefield. The boy had celebrated his third birthday the day before. On March twenty eighth, a rumor circulated so persistently that it plunged alarm into all hearts. The enemy were within five leagues of Paris. The hour had struck for the government to come to a decision. The Regency Council met. At a quarter past eight in the evening, in Napoleon's study, Marie Louise, the chief officers of state, the ministers, and the president of the Senate were present. All of them looked at one another. What were they to do? The question to be decided was whether the Empress and the King of Rome should leave Paris or stay there. Clark, the minister for war, spoke first. He set forth the situation. The city was not fortified, and it was impossible to defend it. In any case, there were not enough soldiers. How many are there? Asked Talleyrand, in his deep, sonorous voice. Barely forty thousand. And the Russians and the Prussians are over one hundred thousand. Clark gave it as his opinion that the Empress and the King of Rome should leave Paris at once. Argument ensued. Champagny and Savary, supported by Cambaceres and Talleyrand. Maintained that it would be a great mistake for the empress to abandon Paris. It would demoralize the people and make them ready to accept defeat. The empress, as regent, should be the heart and soul of the defense. Then Boulay de la Mirth spoke. He addressed himself to Marie Louise, Madame. Remember your august great grandmother Maria Theresa. Follow her example. Show yourself to the people of Paris with the King of Rome in your arms. Then victory will return to us. Marie Louise, with burning ears and tearful eyes, hung her head and made no reply. She was ready to do whatever they decided. A vote was taken, and the council, with the exception of Clark and Joseph, who abstained from voting, decided that the regent should stay in Paris. Then Joseph pulled some papers out of his pocket and addressed the council. I have here, gentlemen, two letters from the emperor, which clearly decide the question with which we are concerned. The first is dated February eighth, and the second March sixteenth, only twelve days ago. Both of them prescribe the Empress's departure. Joseph proceeded to read extracts from Napoleon's two letters. They were in the nature of his last will and testament, and they contained some prophetic passages. If we should lose a battle. And I should be killed. You will get the news before my ministers. Get the Empress and the King of Rome to leave for Rambouillet. Order the Senate, the Council of State, and all the troops to assemble on the Loire. Whatever happens, never let the Empress and the King of Rome fall into the enemy's hands. For my part. I would sooner see my son strangled than brought up in Vienna as an Austrian prince, 
and I have a good enough opinion of the Empress to be equally convinced that she is of the same opinion, so far as a wife and a mother can be. Stay with my son, and remember that I would rather see him in the sign than in the hands of the enemies of France. The council listened with a sigh of relief. At once they were relieved of a crushing burden of responsibility. They voted once more, and this time it was decided that the Empress should leave for Rambouillet. Napoleon's orders, even when they were given at a distance, were not open to argument. It was one o'clock in the morning when the council broke up. Even at this late hour, Joseph and Cambacirus returned to the charge with Marie-Louise. Had she really thought things over, what she was about to do might have disastrous results. It was for her to decide. Hortense added her warning to that of the two men. My sister, she said, at least you must be aware that by leaving Paris you will be stultifying the defense of it, and you will thus lose your crown. You seem to me to be quite resigned to sacrificing it. The Empress, with her Habsburg lip more prominent than ever in her swollen face, replied gently, You are quite right, but it is not my fault. The council has decided that I should go. Nothing was to be got out of her but that passive obedience which she derived from her childhood. She promptly went to bed, while people busied themselves packing in the palace, which hummed all night long like a factory. At seven o'clock on the morning of March 29th, Marie-Louise was up and ready to leave. Joseph sent word to her to wait a little. He was going to La Villette, and would send news from there. If she did not hear from him, she should leave the Tuileries at nine o'clock. Marie-Louise waited in her apartments with her ladies and the King of Rome. All this bustle delighted him. The ladies, having nothing else to do, played with him and made him laugh. His childish laughter rang strangely in the atmosphere of anxiety, which hourly became heavier. Nevertheless, the Empress had had a good breakfast, for nothing ever affected her appetite. Now she could ill-conceal her impatience. Clad in brown riding habit and a traveling cloak, she walked up and down the room, Sometimes she went to a window and looked out, but what was there to see? Ah, if only Napoleon would suddenly make his appearance, or send her orders not to leave Paris. Time passed. At nine o'clock, there was no word from Joseph. Marie-Louise sent to the Ministry of War for news. Though it led her to expect the worst, she decided to wait a little longer. She was not yet at the end of her troubles. A deputation from the National Guard came and begged her not to leave Paris. Then Jerome arrived and in his turn told her to stay. Marie-Louise lost her head. She wept and wrung her hands, flung her hat on her bed, and sank into an armchair. For God's sake, let them make up their minds and put me out of my misery. Then she sent Caffarelli to see Clark. This time his response was definite. The, if, if the Empress did not leave at once, the Minister for War 
could take no responsibility for the consequences. In a few hours, the Cossacks would have cut the roads. We must go, said Marie-Louise with a sigh. Everybody started hurrying out to the carriages. But amid general astonishment, the King of Rome refused to go. Some inner instinct seemed to warn him that these grown-ups who were taking him away were going to make him unhappy. His little soul, that emanation of his father's soul, urged him strongly that they were making a mistake, and that if Napoleon were there, he would denounce such desertion. He screamed. He stamped his foot. He held on to curtains and doorways. Don't let's go to Rambouillet, he cried. It's a beast of a chateau. Let's stay here. Madame de Montesquieu and Madame Soufflot in turn took him in their arms and tried to calm him down. We'll come back, his governess told him. We'll soon come back. But the little king would not listen to them. He clutched the balustrade of the staircase and held on to it with his little fingers riveted to the ironwork. I don't want to leave home. I don't want to go away. Now that Papa is away, I'm the master here. He fought so hard that Monsieur Kenzie, his squire, had to carry him by force to his mother's carriage. Slowly, the long procession got under way. Ten Berlins, baggage wagons, the coronation coach with a cover over it, and a mounted escort of twelve hundred men. A crowd had gathered. In silence, with their hearts full of resentment, they watched their master's wife, who should have defended them, take to flight and abandon them to the enemy. Chapter 23 An Attempt at Suicide Marie-Louise took refuge at Blois. Once there, she did not seem to realize the gravity of what was happening. She lived in the hope that her father would intervene in her favor and that everything would be settled. Her health, for she imagined herself to be ill, concerned her more than the affairs of the empire. One morning, St. Alaire, the emperor's chamberlain, arrived. He announced himself as the bearer of news of extreme importance and was at once ushered in to see the empress. She was still in bed, with one foot sticking out from the bedclothes. St. Alaire informed her that the Senate had decreed the emperor's deposition. He expected to hear sobs and cries of despair. To avoid witnessing the empress's distress, he lowered his eyes. Then he heard Marie-Louise saying to him quite calmly, Oh, you're looking at my foot, are you? I've always been told it's very pretty. It was not until April 7th that the Empress became disturbed. In the morning of that day, Colonel Gabor, sent by the Emperor, <clears throat> informed her that Napoleon had abdicated. Oh no, she cried, it's not possible. My father won't allow it. He himself put me on the throne, and he's told me over and over again that he'd keep me on it. In any case, here is a proclamation which I am addressing to the people of France. I put my son under the protection of the nation. She went on to tell Gabois that she wanted to join the emperor at Fontainebleau. She, when the colonel represented to her 
that the journey might be dangerous. She cried. Why should it be dangerous? You've made it yourself, haven't you? The emperor must be very unhappy now, and it is my duty to be with him. I want to join him. I shall be all right anywhere, so long as I am with him. But Galbois insisted that she should stay at Blois. Marie Louise gave way. Then she wrote two letters, one to her husband, assuring him of her affection, and the other to her father, once more asking him for his help and protection. The next day, however, she changed her mind and made ready to leave. Madame de Montesquieu and Madame de Luquet encouraged her to do so. A carriage was already waiting at the foot of the back stairs. When Madame de Montebello arrived, she was highly indignant. What was the Empress thinking about? How could she dream of taking a rash step which would link her fortunes with those of the Bonapartes, just when they were about to be put under the ban of Europe? Before all else, should she not make sure of an advantageous settlement for the King of Rome? Only the Allies could make such a settlement for him. The last thing Marie Louise should do was appear to be running away from them. The cleverness of these arguments shook Marie Louise. Her indolence, her horror of making an effort, her concern for her health did the rest. She decided to stay. Madame de Montebello had had a scare. In case Marie Louise should suddenly change her mind again, she immediately dispatched her friend, the Baron de Saint Agonon, to see Schwarzenberg. Even then, Marie Louise was not at the end of her troubles. On April 8th, Jerome and Louise Bonaparte arrived. They wanted her to come with them and join the army and the government on the other side of the lure. Marie Louise refused. Jerome and Louise were insistent. They shouted at her and lost their tempers to such an extent that she was afraid of being carried off by force and summoned her servants to protect her. She felt helpless, to be sure. She still talked about going to Fontainebleau. Despite the spitting of blood, which worried her, but even if she was sincere in this intention, she had no time to carry it out. Schwarzenberg had lost no time. During the afternoon of April 8th, Count Chevalov arrived at Blois, as commissioner for the Allied powers, he was instructed to escort the Empress and the King of Rome to Orleans. There was nothing for Marie Louise to do but obey. Her court dispersed. Officials, ladies of the palace, chamberlains, all went their several ways, endowed with handsome gifts. Then Marie Louise said goodbye to Madame Letitia, her mother in law. I hope, Madame, she said, that you will retain the feelings of goodwill towards me with which you have hitherto honored me. Madame Mare looked at her coldly. Her grave tone betrayed her secret resentment against Marie Louise because, at this critical hour, she had so poorly supported the fortunes of the Bonapartes. 
Madame, replied Madame Letitia, that depends on yourself and your future conduct. On April 9th, at ten o'clock in the morning, the Empress set off for Orleans under Count Chavlov's escort. She carried with her all her finery and the crown diamonds. Meneval took over her functions as regent. At Bogency, there was an alarm. Cossacks fell upon the procession and pillaged a few carriages. At six o'clock in the evening, the procession was lodged in the bishop's palace. She was now nearer to Napoleon, and she had not abandoned all idea of joining him. But even if she wanted to do so, it was henceforth impossible. Orders were about to be issued that the Empress was to be prevented by all necessary means from proceeding to Fontainebleau. Napoleon alternated between hope and despair. Sometimes he contemplated death, but still he clung to life. He made plans for the future. For himself he would be content with the island of Elba, but he demanded Tuscany for his wife and his son. He was equally concerned about assuring the future of Eugene, his mother, his brothers, and his sisters. He wanted to put everybody he loved, everybody who had served him well, beyond the reach of want. He arranged his future life. He would live with Marie Louise if she was good enough to join him. If not, he would make no attempt to compel her. Caesar can turn back into a citizen, he said to Colin Court, but it is harder for his wife to stop being Caesar's wife. Every day Napoleon received news of his little king of Rome. To the boy, all his successive changes of residence were simply so many recreations. Clad in a soft blue sailor suit and a black velvet cap, he played innocently in the courtyard of the bishop's palace at Orleans. His pages planted post in it to represent soldiers, and he reviewed them with a wooden sword in his hand. Blutcher is my worst enemy, he said, clenching his little fist, and that wicked old king has taken my father's place and all my toys, but he'll have to give them back to us. How impatient Napoleon was to see his dear little boy again, but one consideration still held him back. Would the climate of Elba suit his wife and his son? In all her letters, Marie Louise complained about her health, she had pains in her chest, and she spat blood. The emperor asked Corvisart, in whom he had every confidence for his opinion. But the doctor betrayed his master. His report was inspired by Madame de Montebello, who pulled all the strings in this hellish plot, and it was drafted before her eyes. Corvisart was quite definite. Neither the Empress nor the King of Rome could live in Elba. It might later be possible for Marie Louise to do so, but she must first make a long stay at Aix and take the waters there. Napoleon was astonished. He pleaded the mildness of the Mediterranean climate, but Corvassar replied, Definitively, Axe will be the Empress's salvation. Elba means death for both mother and son. The Emperor bowed to this verdict, but one hope was still left to him. 
When he set out for Elba, he could go a large part of the way with his wife and his son. He wrote to Marie Louise to arrange this. Then to make sure that nobody should thwart his plan, he sent General Cambrone to Orleans at the head of a detachment of the National Guard with orders to bring the Empress and the King of Rome to Fontainebleau. But alas, when Cambrone reached Orleans on April 13th, he found the nest empty and the birds flown. Almost every day, Marie Louise had received a letter from Napoleon. He wrote in a moving simple strain, Out of the ruins of his great dream, he exerted himself to rebuild a little happiness for the future. My dearest dear, your troubles are much in my heart. They are the only troubles which I cannot bear. So try to rise above adversity. Later today, I shall send you the arrangements that have been made. I am being given the island of Elba, and you and your son are being given Parma, Piacenza, and Guastala. So at least you will have a house and a fine country to live in when you are tired of staying in my island of Elba and get bored with me, as you are bound to do when I am older, while you are still young. As soon as everything is settled, I shall go to Braird. You can meet me there, and then we shall go by way of Moulin and Chambry to Parma, and thence to Spezia to embark. I am in good health, and my courage is equal to anything. Above all, if you can reconcile yourself to my misfortune, and if you think you can still find happiness in it. Goodbye, my dear. I think of you and your troubles. Mean much to me. All yours. Nap. Fontainebleau. April 11th, at 9 o'clock in the morning. Marie Louise received this letter during the morning of April 12th, in the evening of the same day. Bossette brought her a second letter from Napoleon, in which he confirmed the first, and asked her whether the arrangement for them to travel together to Parma suited her. But Bassett was also the bearer of another letter, written by Metternich, who had arrived in Paris the day before. In this letter, the Chancellor sang a siren song. The Allies proposed to endow the ex-Empress with an independent income, which would pass to her son, but it would be better if, as the Emperor Francis himself wished, she should first proceed to Austria with the King of Rome. In any case, let her be assured. She might have an easy mind both about the present and about the future. Hard on the heels of this letter arrived Prince Paul Esterhazy and Prince Lichtenstein, they were instructed to escort Marie Louise to Rambouillet, where, so they said, her father awaited her. They assured her that Napoleon gave his consent to this journey. How could she resist such promises? On the night of April 12th, she let them take her and the King of Rome to Rambouillet. The Austrian eagle had fastened its claws upon the French eaglet. It was never to let him go again. Even before Cambrone's return, Napoleon knew what had happened. 
a letter from Meneval had informed him. So what he had dreaded, so much had come to pass. He had been robbed of his son. He remembered what he had written to his brother Joseph on February 8th. I would sooner see my son strangled than brought up in Vienna as an Austrian prince. Napoleon was now more or less a prisoner at Fontainebleau. Every exit was under guard. He was all alone. Nobody came to see him, and every day brought fresh desertions among those around him. Everybody found some pretext for going away. One man's wife was ill. Another had urgent business in Paris. A third was called away by a sudden death in his family. Napoleon made no effort to keep anybody. He amused himself by reading the papers, which loaded him with insults. The night after the news from Blois had reached him, Napoleon went to bed at ten o'clock. He seemed quite calm, and nobody noticed any change in his habits. At midnight he got up and summoned his valet. Hubbard, he said, light the fire. In his nightshirt, Napoleon helped to get the fire going. When it was burning briskly, he said, Hubbard, bring me writing material, and then go to bed. His valet did as he was told and left the room. Napoleon donned a dressing gown and walked up and down. Hubbard had left the door ajar. He watched Napoleon walking about, sitting down, writing, tearing up papers. Then he stood up and walked about again, this time more quickly. Uneasy about his unusual agitation, Hubbard went on watching him with growing anxiety. Napoleon came to a standstill, as though on the brink of a precipice down which he must throw himself. Darkness and disaster hemmed him in on all sides. He had reached the depths of misfortune, and thence he could measure the immensity of human cowardice and human cruelty. He passed his hand across his brow, on which his curling lock was damp with cold sweat. My son, my son, he murmured, what have I left to live for now? He made his way to the dressing case, which stood open on his bedside table. His movements were hurried. He was impatient to be done with it. He took out a little black taffeta sachet in the shape of a heart. Here is deliverance, he said to himself. It was the sachet which he hung round his neck every morning. It contained a poison prepared by Yvonne in accordance with Cabanus's formula, the same poison with which Condorcet had done himself to death to escape the guillotine. Napoleon split the sachet open and emptied its contents into a glass containing a little water and sugar. He stirred it with a spoon. Without hesitation, he swallowed the mixture. Then he went and lay down at full length, closed his eyes, and awaited death. Hubbard had followed what he was doing. Fearing that he understood it only too well, he went on watching with dread in his heart. Several minutes went by. All at once Hubbard heard groans and moans. He rushed into the room. Napoleon lay on his back with his nightshirt open. There was a little foam at the corner of his mouth. His eyes were turned up, and he was clawing at his chest. The startled valet rushed out into the passage. Help, the emperor is dying. Candles were lit in all directions. A mad rush shook the palace. Yvonne the surgeon, Grand Marshal Bertrand, and Cullen Court reached Napoleon's room. Yvonne tore his hair. Woe is me, he cried. Everybody will think I poisoned him. He rushed out of the room, out of the palace, like a madman. A horse was tethered to the railings. Yvonne untethered it leapt into the saddle, 
and fled for Paris at a gallop. That very morning, Napoleon had given him 200,000 francs, a pension of 40,000 francs, and the cross of the Legion of Honor. In the bedroom, they were busy around Napoleon. In between hiccups, he besought them, Let me die, have pity on me, let me die. He seized Colincourt's hand. My dear friend, look after my wife and my son. Cadet, the chemist, had been hastily summoned. He forced Napoleon to swallow several cups of hot tea. Finally, he was able to vomit, and he became bathed in sweat. It was a healthy reaction. He became drowsy and went to sleep for several hours. When Napoleon awakened, he looked around him, astonished to find that he was still alive. So death itself had betrayed him. Ah, he said, it was not God's will. Thus he accepted life again.